where we left off, we were going to talk about biogeography. There's that BIO again. So, um, sorry, does anybody, does anybody need any notes before I get started? Does anyone need? I, now I have them. So, biogeography is where we left off. Bio, BIO. There's that BIO again. What does BIO mean? Good. Okay, life, living thing. Excellent. Geography means like where things are in the world. So um, we're looking at the ge geographic distribution of living things over time. So one of the things we know about humans is that we split from a common ancestor with the primates in Africa a long, long time ago. That's where the first human-like ancestors originated. So we look at those things. And when fossils are found and collected, they start to map out where they believe that, for example, with humans, the treks that they made to go into different environments. A big influence on biogeography is also continental drift. So the continents. The continents, uh, if you look at your pictures below, you can see that the continents are in a state of shifting. And over long periods of time, they do move around the globe. Continental drift is why we get things like earthquakes and tsunamis is the movement of those tectonic plates that when, when you have them coming together, they can cause an earthquake. They can, one can go under the other and cause a mountain range to form. A shift can cause a big wave to happen and have a tsunami. So where, if you have two of the continents and they're like this and they start to move apart, the organisms that had access together who were one population, you get a shift in them, a quick shift, and they're far enough apart that they don't have access to one another. So what happens with these organisms is that they'll start to experience the process of natural selection what that environment selects for over time. One that probably maybe makes things a little bit more obvious in terms of continental drift having an effect on biogeography is that if you have two plates and one goes under the other one and causes a mountain range to form. And that mountain range will cause a barrier between the population on this side and the population on that side. And what you may have happen is that on this side of the mountain over here, that the species that are there, they don't get as much access to sunlight. And it gets colder because this mountain has formed. So now what's selected for over here would be the organisms in the population or the variants in the population that have maybe like thicker fur or more fat on them where they can withstand the cold temperatures better. On this side, if there's a lot of sunlight, then you have different traits or characteristics that are favored over here. So the process of nat natural selection is influenced directly by continental drift. And we've seen that over time. So remember when I talked about Darwin the other day and he was studying rabbits in different areas of the world and he noticed that rabbits in England were a little bit chubbier, had thicker fur and had shorter ears and then the ones in South America near the equator were a lot slimmer, had very short hair and very long ears. And he looked at, well, they must have been together, maybe like on the same continent. And as continental drift happened, that different characteristics were selected for in the different environments. Although they still have a common ancestor. So I, I always think this is fascinating. 250 million years ago, there was one landmass called Pangaea. And I think an interesting thing when you look at these landmasses is they're like pieces of a puzzle. So that, for example, like when we look at today's movement of continental drift over time, that the shape of the coast of South America would fit right into the shape of the coast of Africa like two pieces of the puzzle that you see here, they were together at one point. Now, 
this isn't something that they're just like moving, right? We don't feel like, whoa, we got to hold on, the continents are moving, but they do take a long time. So from 250 million years ago, that we go through starting to get some separation, we start to get like two major man land masses, or maybe like one, two, three, four, kind of, and then they start moving until we get what we know today, that this is a very slow process, but on cases where maybe something like a landmass slips really quick, it can cause something drastic to happen. All right, a little bit about natural selection. Remember, nature selects for the organisms that have the best adaptations, meaning the best genes or characteristics given the current environment. When we're talking about natural selection and we're looking at advantageous genes and those that are not as advantageous, we're looking at survival. So if you have advantageous genes, you can survive well in your environment. Don't use, do not use terms like the stronger, you're gonna try and slip into this in the next few labs. The stronger one beats out the weaker one. Dinosaurs were pretty strong, right? Big muscular, ah, bird, dinosaur, uh, reptile thingies, right? They were stronger than the weaker mammals. But who survived when that meteorite crashed? The weaker ones, right? So don't fall into this trap. We use advantageous, non-advantageous. Adapted, not adapted. But this is a big, big no-no. And especially when you go into your higher level classes, some of you will go on to take an evolution class and your professor will be mortified if you use these words and will probably majorly penalize you and think, what a ding dong. So don't use these. Just like that's one thing for the future, really, is that we're talking adapted or not well adapted. Well adapted, not well adapted. Advantageous genes, not advantageous genes. Molecular biology plays a big current role in how we see the relationship between organisms over time. And there's some really fascinating things. I always like to tell students here that if you're interested in going to like biotechnology or bioengineering, UIC has a really great master's program in bioengineering. So you're an engineer, but you're a biology engineer. They have a really great program. This is an exploding field. It starts with like just the ability to take a genome of an organism and catalog all the genes. And then once even you do that, you have to figure out, well, what, is, what do all these A, T's, G's, and C's mean? What, what is the meaning of this? So then figuring that out. And you can go in a lot of di different directions with molecular biology or bioengineering is that you can try and figure out cures for diseases. You can just look at genomes and try and solve what, are, what do all these genes mean. If we're looking at, for example, the human genome, people are looking at pieces of those genes to see how can we manipulate these genes to cure diseases? How can we change those genes? How can we come up with medications, treatments to affect certain genes? So like cancers, for example, there's a lot of like, if you're suspected of having, um, let's say breast cancer, and you, they test for a few genes, and if they find that you have a certain kind of, maybe um, like for example, my best friend, she had, um, check two positive breast cancer. And they look at three different specific genes and she was positive for three different genes. Now her mom who had that cancer and fought that cancer for 20 years, there wasn't treatment for her mom. And so it was like a maintenance, like how do we just kind of keep her as healthy as possible while fighting this cancer because they don't have the, the tools to, to cure it. But my best friend come 20 years later and because, and you know, it's kind of interesting because she was positive for all three of these breast cancer genes. That was actually much better than being positive for one or two only. That having all three, there's a treatment for that. And they actually knocked out her breast cancer. And um, she's five years, six years now, um, free of that cancer. So 
that's kind of the things that you can do with molecular biology, is you can look at genes and figure out what's the best course of treatment given someone who has these specific gene sequences. We use this in evolution to tell like, well, how are organisms related? And we can look at their relationships in a wide variety of ways. So um, it's more than just like, you know, we, we can look at the bones or we can kind of look at how we look or we can look at their embryonic stages, but we can look deep into the genetics and see sequences of DNA and then show like, oh, if they have the same sequence or a similar sequence for the same kind of protein, that gives us evidence that they are more closely related. There's been studies done of proteins in as many organisms as we have sequenced, and they look at these specific protein, the um, nucleotide sequences that make up these proteins, and then they can go like, well, here's the protein genes, and here's the DNA sequence, and they can compare between different organisms to see how closely related they are. So we have even like, all the way down to the molecular level, we can start studying how organisms are related. It's pretty interesting. This particular protein sequence, cytochrome C, is found in every organism that we've sequenced so far. So there's evidence that all organisms come from a common ancestor. It's pretty fascinating. So even just like thinking about us or an elephant, or the tree outside, the mushroom that you ate on your pizza this week, and a bacterium, we all have this cytochrome C protein. So we can isolate specific genes. We can isolate, okay, this area of a chromosome and these particular nucleotides in this order code for this particular trait. We're going to use this when we look at Hardy Weinberg later in the lecture and what we're going to look at in lab next week. So what we know is the more related two organisms are, the more closely matching their nucleotide sequences will be. So, so many fascinating, amazing ways that you can use this. They're using molecular technology to fight climate change. They're looking at all kinds of different ways to utilize molecular techniques. But in genetics, shows us how closely related organisms are. So this is another kind of like way if you're looking at, for example, that certain plants can take extra or more carbon out of the atmosphere and you start sequencing different plants, you can find maybe identify plants who are better at sucking up that carbon dioxide than others. And that would be a great application in terms of fighting climate change. So there's a lot of different ways to use this in terms of evolution, not just like, cool, they're related, but we can actually use the organisms to identify what they're good at based in their genes and find related organisms to kind of group them and utilize those technologies for the sake of humans. Remember we talked about ecosystem services. So a lot of applications within this idea of evolution to our own ecosystem services. So this, for example, we're looking at cytochrome C between humans and mice, and there's only 30 different nucleotides. So that shows us that even though we are vastly different, I always wonder why they put like naked people in the illustrations of humans, but I don't know. Um, I guess the mouse is naked too. So even though we look like really, really different and our characteristics are, of our genetics are expressed very differently and the mouse is really tiny and we're big, we are vertebrates, the mouse has the same forelimb structure we look at their genetics, only 30 different nucleotides vary in the expression of this particular protein. I think that's pretty fascinating. All right, so a major trend in evolution is that what form gives rise to what ones? Let's take a look at the ideas. Large ones, large forms give rise to smaller forms. Sometimes, but not always. 
Smaller give rise to larger ones? Sometimes, but not always. Simple ones, simple forms give rise to more complex? That sounds pretty good. Okay. More complex give rise to simple? I mean, sometimes, but not always, and not often. Weaker give rise to stronger? Don't use those words, right? Okay, so C is the best choice here. These kind of questions are often found on any, any boards that any of you are gonna take. They love to do these this to this, this to this. So this is a good example, just make sure you understand how this kind of question works because you all see it again and you know you have to know how to do this. All right, some misconceptions about evolution. We're gonna take a look at all of these, so we'll go one by one and talk about that. Evolution is just a theory. Can something be like just a theory? I mean, a theory, let's look back at the definition of theory. Theory means that the wide scientific community has tons and tons of studies and data, and they all come to the same conclusion. Can something be like, mm, like just a theory? It's a, if you're a theory or you're not, period. So when we're talking about a theory, it means, again, tons and tons and tons of evidence by lots and lots and lots of scientists. Everybody's coming to the same conclusion. So a lot of times when people say, well, and, and remember too, also I said that there's two major parts of evolution. There's the hypothesis, how life started, and then the theory part is all that data that shows that organisms change over long periods of time. They are adapted, the better adapted you are, the easier time you have surviving and passing on your genes to offspring. Individuals evolve. So can I just be like, I'm going to evolve, Poop, and I get wings. <laughs> can I evolve? No, populations evolve. So there's this long process that is guided by natural selection and mutation that when we're looking at evolution, we're talking about entire populations. When the environment changes, if there's enough variation in a population and portions of that population have advantageous genes to deal with and survive in the environment of that shift, they will have an easier time surviving, they will have more time to reproduce, and pass on genes to their offspring. Evolution explains the origins of life. No, it doesn't. We have ideas of how life may have started, and we're gonna to get to that in a few lectures, but we do not know how life started. Organisms evolve on purpose. Can I again be like, okay, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have an offspring, I'm gonna make my eggs change so that my offspring can have gills and swim over underwater like I've always wanted. No, right? We can't direct the mutations that occur in our eggs and in our sperm. The mutations, the mistakes happen totally by chance. It takes a very quick amount of time to copy the large volume of DNA of an organism's genes through the process of either meiosis, when sperm and egg are made to make offspring, or when we're talking about asexual reproduction, that bacterium, the archaea, the bacteria, some protists, that they copy their genes and they make an exact copy or a close copy of themselves, that copying that DNA through those different forms, through meiosis or asexual reproduction, is that there are going to be mistakes that will be made. Those mistakes happen by chance. Just like if I told you all, like let's say if I said, okay, uh, we got, you know, like a little bit of time, we got like 40 minutes left, or I mean uh, 20 minutes left of class, I want you to rewrite all the notes in that packet in the next 20 minutes. Are you intentionally going to make mistakes? I mean, most of you won't, some of you won't. But, uh, you will try and do your best, right? And because you're rushing, you will make mistakes. And that's just the way evolution works, that 
mutations happen by chance, and so what mutations pop up can be beneficial, advantageous, and given the current environment. They can be like another option, like brown hair versus blonde hair, or they can be negative, that they can have a negative effect on the offspring. So it all just happens by chance. It's not directed, it's not chosen, by chance, by chance, by, by, by chance. Climate change is influencing evolution. It absolutely is. Who's still getting bitten by mosquitoes? Yeah, I got a bite yesterday. I was outside, I was picking tomatoes from my garden, and I thought, oh, that itches suddenly. And there's like mosquitoes flying around me. Usually they're gone by now, even with some like cooler weather. I got bit by mosquitoes back in March of last year, or this year, this year I mean. So the mosquito season is getting much longer because weather is warmer. We usually see that really limited to just a few, we used to see it limited in a few months in the summer, but now mosquitoes who used to have one kind of like cycle of offspring, they're getting into two cycles of offspring in the long summers. So we have a lot more mosquitoes. For us, it's not a big deal, right? I got a mosquito bite and it itched and but what if it's carrying malaria? And what we're seeing is that mosquitoes who can carry very dangerous diseases are spreading to more areas of the world and they're having more cycles of reproduction, which means that they're sticking around a lot longer as well. We are also seeing shifts and migration of a lot of organisms. That where we would be able to predict where organisms migrated, like whales, for example, they could predict, okay, they're gonna go from South America, they're gonna go up past the coast of Mexico, all the way up the coast of the United States, and then they're going to go up to Alaska and Canada, and then they're going to make their way back down, and they would have this like yearly up and back. Now, they might be hanging around in one area and just staying for a while, and everybody's like, why? Well, they're just staying in the colder waters for longer periods of time. Um, also, a lot of birds that would do the same kind of like sim similar migrations, like fly from Canada down to South America and back. Because Canada is not getting as cold as long, a lot of them are just staying up in Canada. And remember that we talked about keystone species, that a lot of these migrators, when they come to all of these different areas, they're leaving important services in each area that a lot of other organisms rely on them showing up and doing this, or even like their feces, for example. The nutrients and their feces are really important for other organisms and the ecosystems that they go to. So if they're not going to these ecosystems, a lot of other organisms are affected. So more, as I mentioned, more and more mosquitoes. Oh, is that at the bottom of the next page? One of the things that I've noticed is the mosquitoes in our area, that I am very susceptible to the um, to getting an allergic reaction from their stings, that it will itch now, like the last couple of years, it'll itch for like maybe a half hour and then it just stops. That I'm not having as bad of allergic reactions. I used to get welts like that. Like I'd get a mosquito bite on my hand and my whole hand would swell up. Now it's just like, oh, it's a little thing and then even the one that bit me yesterday, I can't even tell you where it is. I'm not having that allergic reaction. I don't know if any of you have seen something like that. Another example are red squirrels, that red squirrels are starting to reproduce 18 days earlier than they did 10 years ago. That's because spring is arriving sooner. So everything is shifting. These squirrels now have more advantages in being able to reproduce earlier and colonize areas as it gets warmer that they can move right in, whereas even like 18 days later, then other ones are starting to show up and they're like, crud, 
the red squirrels have taken up all of the good spots. So because they have adapted to arriving earlier in places and reproducing earlier, they're crowding out other species as well. And these owls here, so you've got these two variants. When we were looking at back when snow was more common in the area where they lived, that this variant, who has a lot more white on them, blended in well with the bark of trees. With the bark, the tree bark would get some snow kind of stuck in between the ruts of the bark, and so they could sit in the tree and just look like snowy tree bark. But with less snow, they're sticking out. Like you see this white owl. This one is favored because it looks more like bark without snow on it. So we've seen with less snow that the trait that is favored has changed recently. It is believed and supported by a lot of evidence that every single species on the earth is being affected by humans influencing the acceleration of climate change. Does that make you feel badly as a human? Maybe, maybe not. One, one of the things that we said are a misconception about evolution is that individuals can evolve. We're going to look at how populations evolve and what we're really talking about, the core of evolution, is that groups and their variations and changes in the environment will depend on how those groups change over time. So, Again, evolution is a property of populations, not individuals. Remember that when we're talking about population, we're talking about a group of organisms that are the same species. So us, for example, as Homo sapiens, we live in the same place at the same time, and we have the potential to interbreed, which when we're talking about this potential to interbreed, means that we have the ability to have sex and have offspring successfully, but we gotta move on a little bit further with those offspring in terms of evolution, is that it is important for a population in an area to not only interbreed, have offspring, but that those offspring are fertile, which means that the offspring can then potentially interbreed and keep the population going. Because if you can't keep a population going, the population can go extinct. It can no longer evolve. So there's a lot of little pieces in here that are really important. Same species, live in the same place, the same time, can potentially interbreed and have fertile offspring. Within a population, there's what's called a gene pool. What that means is all of the genes all of the variations within the genes that a population has. Variation, the way it is manifested in genetics, it is called alleles. Alleles are alternate, alternate versions of a gene. So for example, we have alleles for handedness, right? We've got right-handed alleles and left-handed alleles. We've got different versions or variations of that gene. The gene is for which dominant hand you have, and you either have dominant right hand genes, you have a combination of a right hand and a left hand, or you have two recessive left-handed genes. We have two chromosomes of each kind in humans. Well, I, I should say in all higher organisms, for example. Um, in humans, we have 46 total chromosomes, but we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. We call our pairs of chromosomes homologous chromosomes. Where did we see homologous on Tuesday? Remember when we talked about... 
Yes, we had homologous structures that we talked about. H-O-M-O -O means same. We see this term a lot. Homo hetero, hetero means different. We use that a lot in biology. Homologous chromosomes are similar chromosomes that have the same gene banding pattern throughout them. Why do we have two of each kind of chromosome or a homologous pair? Where do we get them from? Yes. Yeah, biological mom and biological dad. That's why you have two of each kind. We have 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes, which means we have 46 total chromosomes. You get one of each pair from biological mom and one from biological dad. They are similar but they have the same gene banding pattern. So that on the mom and the dad, you'll have the gene for, let's say, height, or a gene for height. Uh, the way genetics typically works is that you have many genes that code for a single trait. So one of the genes for height, one of the genes for eye color, one of the genes for hair color. They all are present in the same order, but you could have two of the same, two of the same, or you could have different alleles for this particular trait. All right, so what does this have to do with evolution? We can take a look at genes in a population right now, and then we can come back and take a look at them in 20, 30, 50, 100 generations. And if the frequencies of those traits have changed, it supports that evolution has chain or uh, the population has evolved over time. One of the things we can look at is a concept of complete dominance in our genes that you have a dominant allele that masks the recessive allele. The recessive allele is only seen when you receive a recessive allele from both parents that you have two homologous or the same kinds of genes. So we're going to use this. Uh, one thing that I do want to point out is the majority, again, the majority of our genes do not work in this means of complete dominance. If you took 111, you focused a lot on complete dominance, but there's very, very, very few genes where there's one pair of genes that code for one trait. Most of our traits, like hair color, for example, there could be as many as 30 genes that code for your hair color. Height is a really, um, probably a more obvious one. So like my brother-in-law, his parents were both about five foot and five one. They're little. He is six two. How can that possibly happen? But his dad's brothers were both like six two and six four. So there's a lot of different genes that account for a trait. In the case of Dan, he received a lot of the tall genes, where in the case of his dad, Dieter, he received a lot of the short genes. So you have a lot of different combinations that lead to a lot of our traits. And that's why sometimes you can go like, wait, how can this be? Genetics is very complicated. So we can measure the frequency. When we're talking about frequency, we're talking about the percentage of the different alleles. So handedness is one of the ones that we still know to go by complete dominance in humans is that there are two alleles that code for one trait. And you could look at a population now and let's say that 70% of the population expresses the dominant trait and you have 30% that expresses the recessive trait. You come back in 20, 30, 100 generations. And if those frequencies have changed to 40 and 60, then you know that evolution has occurred. Something was favored more than something else. So we can use, I love math, we can use math to show that evolution is happening. So there's so many different means of studying evolution from just looking at traits, right? By looking at the homologous structures, by looking at the embryos, by looking at the skulls, by going as far as the biotechnology and looking at genetics and then using genetics to work with math to show us how evolution occurs. So allele frequency, again, anytime we're looking at frequency, we're looking at a proportion 
of that allele or that version of the gene in the population, we're talking percentages. What percent of the population has that allele? So for example, we're going to look at pea plants and we are going to look at, we're gonna look at height. In this case, my example looks at flower color. So we have 100 pea plants. There's 200 alleles for flower color. 100 pea plants have two alleles for every trait. You have two alleles for this trait because you get one allele from biological mom, one from biological dad, and together those two alleles code for the trait. So when I say 100 pea plants, and I'm looking at a specific trait that we're only looking at one gene for that trait, you have 200 alleles. One from mom, one from dad. So 100 times two gives you 200 alleles. So if 50 of those alleles code for white flowers, if you want to take out your phone and do this calculation, and feel free. 50 alleles out of, not 100 alleles, out of 200, 200 alleles. How do you think about how you get the frequency or percentage? So I'll give you a second if you want to use your calculator. Some of you, boop, got it in your heads because you're fantastic. All right, so let's start with how do we calculate this? What do we do? What do, we do? Good. 50, when we're talking about the white flower alleles, we said that 50 is out of 200 total alleles. So that's how we're going to get the frequency or the percentage of the white flower alleles. So what did y'all come up with then? Good. Sorry. So we came up with 20.25. 50 divided by 200 gives you a quarter, 0.25, times that by 100 to get the percentage or 25%. So in our population, 25% of the alleles code for white flower color. When you have more than one different kind of allele for a trait, we call that a mutation. Mutations, again, are just mistakes in the copying of the DNA. Mutations give us those different alleles or variations in a population. Remember that mutations are sometimes good, sometimes just give you a different version, not good, not bad, and sometimes they are bad. And so the majority of the time when we're looking at mutations, they're usually like, they don't really like do that much. And then you have the extremes of a better trait or a not so great trait. So mutation again, change in the allele frequency within the DNA. So you're changing the nucleotides. Are you like thinking about, I'm gonna make that change or is it a mistake? just a mistake, it happens by chance. You can't, in your own cells, you can't manipulate your DNA. But we have things like technology like CRISPR, if you've heard about that, is they can go in and they can like add nucleotides, they can take nucleotides out, they can change nucleotides. And so we have the ability to go in and change genetics. So, when mistakes are made, there are these checkpoints. When the DNA is copied from one cell to the next, when we're talking about evolution, it is way more important to the offspring that the sperm and egg have mutations because that's how we make the next generation. So like if you have a mutation, like let's say in your heart cells, that you have a billion heart cells, and like every day you have a couple that are mutants that don't function, is that a big deal? Is that a big deal to your offspring? No, it doesn't, you know, it's not a big deal to your offspring. But in the making of sperm or egg, is that a big deal to the offspring? Yeah, and that's where we're looking at evolution. So when we're looking at these mutations, 
We're looking at the mistakes that are passed on to our offspring that cause evolution to occur, or assist with evolution, I should say. When we're talking about these mutations that happen to genes, that these mutations manifest themselves in characteristics. And when we're talking about characteristics of a trait, the trait could be something external, how you look. The trait could be in your physiology, how your heart pumps. The trait could be in your behaviors. Do you ever notice in biological families that there may be people who act like, if, you know, perhaps even you, that if you know your biological parents and perhaps it's like you and your mom, you do things very similarly that's based in the genes that she passed on to you and the egg that was passed on to help make you, that our behaviors are passed on as well. It's a little harder to wrap your brain around, but we do pass on behaviors. Mutations don't happen in anticipation of the environment changing. So again, the earth, if it's flooding, I can't be like, I'm going to pop out an offspring who's going to have gills and they're going to have fins instead of arms. I'm going to, I'm going to will that to happen. I can't, I can't make that happen. So you either have those chance mutations that are beneficial or not. So you match the environment or you don't. That's the way it goes. Chance, 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 any chance. The way that organisms have changed over long periods of time, what characteristics have been favored and have allowed populations to survive, or what traits have not been advantageous or not favored, they go extinct. That's all by chance. Again, mutations can be rough, they can be good, or they can be eh, kind of somewhere in between. Just give us some variation. Variations that are right now, like let's say there's a variation and it's like, well, it doesn't give you a benefit or it's not disadvantage, disadvantageous, I'm having trouble with that word today. Maybe in 30 years or 10 years or five years, one of those genes that didn't have an advantage now may have an advantage in the future. Mutation is a driving force in the potential for evolutionary change. Having more variation in a population is really, really good. So other forces, there's other forces, natural selection, just not the mutations, the mistakes that are made in mutations, but the environment will help to spread genes to other places. Could eliminate a population, Excuse me, the environment could not favor some trait and eliminate that trait from the population. If you by chance have advantageous genes in the current environment, you have an easier time surviving, you're real chill, going about your day, surviving, you have time for reproduction, Those that currently in the given environment that have advantageous genes will have more time to reproduce and therefore there will be a greater frequency of those advantageous genes in the current population. But that could change any minute because the environment could change any minute. So it's all minute by minute, chance by chance. Environment, natural selection. The environment selects for 
the best genes or traits. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, it, it can, but humans, we have weird cognition, and I'm always like, you know, like for example, I said the other day that if, if our idea of beauty is like really skinny and we have a famine, is that a good thing that we've been choosing? I mean, not everybody chooses that, thankfully, but it's not a good thing as humans, right? To look at, like, when you're looking for a mate, if you're somebody who's so influenced by the idea of beauty being skinny, then you choose someone who's really skinny, maybe someone who's really fit, and then there's a famine, you and your offspring don't have the advent advantageous traits, right? So we have a weird thing with cognition that allows us to choose what we think are advantageous traits when they really, you start thinking about it, they're really not. Because given the current environment, wouldn't advantageous traits be really dark skin? If we're having a lot more sun, warmth, et cetera, right? So like when you look at someone that you potentially want to you know, go on a date with, are you thinking biologically? Are you looking biologically for what traits that you want your offspring to have? Because wouldn't you be like, well, I want somebody who, you know, you might have your list of like, manages money well, has darker skin, darker eyes, and has, is not like super skinny. And so like those things are different than often what we're attracted to. And some of those weird attraction things are also based in our genetics that if you're, family has always been making these choices influenced more by society than it is by biology, those behaviors are passed on. So um, kind of is the answer to that question. And it depends on, it, it depends on how much, you know, our society doesn't value those things as much as like our, the survival of our species. and calling the survival of our species what's sexy, as opposed to just these like random, this is the sexy thing. So your next date, you're gonna be like. Most commercial pesticides are effective for only about two to three years. This is because new pests invade the area. Maybe, maybe. The chemicals, induce mutations that convey immunity. I mean, like maybe a little bit, but you know, cause then that, that's like, can, it probably more so it causes them to die, the chemicals, than to be better. Uh, the chemicals mutate. I mean, they might degrade, mutate. The pests learn to ignore the chemicals. But if they're everywhere, I don't know. The pests with advantageous mutations will survive and reproduce. Well, that sounds very evolution-y. I like that. Okay, so uh, what happens is, is that simultaneously with the making of new chemicals for like corn, for example, to fight off different kinds of pests, like let's say, for example, um, a fungus that causes corn to degrade. These, when we're talking pests, it might not just be insects, it could be things like a fungus, it could be a bacterial infection. And because those have shorter generation times, like for a fungus to make a new generation, it's much shorter, they have the ability to make more mutations. And having more mutations will allow them to be able to live in the environment, or may, I should say may, Lit, allow them to live in the environment of certain chemicals. And so then we end up with just this by chance advantage because of quick generation times for them to have these chance mutations against chemicals. And then if that happens, then you gotta go back to the drawing board and make new chemicals. But maybe what if we just like grew corn more naturally and didn't use chemicals might be a better option and also healthier for humans. So we don't always, we want quick money, money talks. All right, anatomy.
expectation, again, we talked about this in the last lecture, you have a trait that is based in genes that by chance allows you to survive better in the current environment. So like as humans, we might talk about like, you know, like you start the semester and you have to adapt to dealing with all of us, all of our different personalities and the way that we run our classes. That's not what biological adaptation means. That means that, again, it's in your genes, that you have in your genes the ability to survive in the current environment. Or you don't. Fitness. We're not talking about like, hey, we're gonna do fitness, we're gonna look up. That's not what fitness, the way we use it, means. Fitness is a reproductive term. Individuals who are more fit have an easier time surviving in the current environment, which means they have more advantageous genes. If you're more fit and you have more advantageous genes, you have an easier time surviving, you have more time for reproduction, and you likely pass on more good advantageous genes to your offspring. You have more offspring. So those that are more fit will have more offspring. That's what biological fitness means. Right? You're not going to the gym to get fit so you can reproduce more. I mean, maybe some of you don't know. But that's not what we mean by biological fitness. It's having more offspring because you have advantageous traits. You have time to reproduce. Populations change because the environment changes. So what's favored or what is advantageous will change when the environment shifts. Dinosaurs, who are a relative of li lizards and some birds, that what we have seen over time, that big dinosaurs have evolved to becoming smaller like reptiles and birds because the environment changed over time. More species, more space taken up, so you gotta be a little bit smaller in size. Natural selection is also often called survival, there's survive, of the fittest. Those who have the advantageous genes have an easier time surviving and passing on offspring. So this whole idea of evolution in these two terms, natural selection and survival of the fittest, tells you a lot of things here, that nature selects for the fittest, the fittest have the easier time surviving, fitness goes back to reproduction, they have more offspring given the current environment. So right there, you've got a lot to think about. We find our genes in the gene pool, all the different variations within a population. Do you think a very, a very variant, do you think a population that has a lot of variation, a lot of diversity in their genes is better than a population that's really similar? The more variation, the better you are. If everybody's the same and the environment suddenly changes and what makes us all the same is not favored, boop, bye, we're all gone. So the more variation in the population is very beneficial because you don't know what changes are coming in the environment. That those changes can happen quickly and if we have variation, we're like, I hope somebody's gonna Some bacteria have evolved adaptations to survive in the presence of antibiotics. Is this a big deal for humans right now? Yes. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. So bacteria have very short generation times. They can, uh, many of them within 20 minutes to a couple hours, they can have a next generation, which means they have, because they can reproduce quickly, they have more opportunity for evolution, or I say quicker opportunities for evolution. More mistakes can be made. And we're gonna look at this in lab next week, that we're going to take some bacteria and put them on a plate 
that and we're going to put different kinds of antibiotics on that plate and we're going to see how the bacteria survive or don't survive in the presence of all those different uh, antibiotics. So like here, for example, we're looking at like a plate that has one kind of antibiotic. Now we have some variation in this original population. And in this population, you can see all those, those different groups or colonies. The red dots are not individual bacteria, but they are colonies or big groups of bacteria. And so then they take that plate, they put it on there, they're gonna put antibiotic on this plate. And then over the course of a few days, they're gonna go back and look and see, did anybody survive? Did any of these groups survive in the presence of the antibiotic? And the ones that survive had the beneficial gene or resistance to this particular antibiotic. In our example here, we're looking at one antibiotic. Next week, we're gonna look at six different antibiotics. You may find that the bacteria that we are plating out may be resistant to more than one. That's good for the bacteria, right? Antibiotic resistance is really great for the species of bacteria. The bacteria having a lot of different resistance to a lot of antibiotics, is that good for us? No. So when we're thinking about this idea of antibiotic resistance, we have to put the focus on what's beneficial for the bacteria. The opposite will be beneficial for us. The more resistance they have, good for them, bad for us. The less resistance they have, it's good for us. A bacterial allele that conveys resistance to this specific kind of antibiotic called streptomycin. Is it always beneficial to the bacteria? What if it's not in the presence of streptomycin antibiotic? Do they have a benefit? No, it's like, it's like one of those instances where you have a variation of a gene, but it's not helping you, but it's not harming you but it's there, and in case they ever come in contact with streptomycin, then that thing that didn't benefit them before suddenly is beneficial. Is beneficial to the cell in the presence of streptomycin? Yeah, yeah, that sounds really good, right? If you have a gene for resistance to an uh, antibiotic that will kill you, and then you have that resistance, that's good, you won't be killed. Is neutral? neither beneficial nor detrimental to the cell. Not in this case, right? It depends, well, it depends. It's like, yeah, in the presence of streptomycin, which it says. So it can be, it can be neutral, right? It depends on if you're in that environment or not. But this is better, right? Is beneficial to the cell in the absence of streptomycin? Well, we said, no, it's not a benefit when streptomycin isn't around. Is always detrimental to the cell? Well, that's just. So the best choice is, is beneficial to the cell in the presence of streptomycin. Now, let's think about the next step in this idea. Bacteria get resistance to antibiotics. Because they are in the presence of the antibiotic and mutate, they force themselves to mutate become better suited to living in that environment. Can they force themselves to mutate? No, not, no good. So that has a lot of words and it sounds real smart, but it's not true. Bacteria get resistance to antibiotics because the antibiotics cause the mutation. No, the environment doesn't cause the mutation. Mistakes in the copying of the DNA from one cell to the next causes the mutation. Bacteria get resistant to antibiotics because some of them just happen, I like that word, happen to have a mutation to the antibiotic already. They survive and pass on those advantageous genes to the offspring. I like that. That sounds, sounds really good. Bacteria get resistant to antibiotics because the environment influences the bacteria to have a mutation. Can the environment force mutations on an organism? So, yeah, C. Even though A had a lot of words and it 
sounded real like wordy, biology -y. You got it. This is a case where you have to be very careful with word choice. Mutations happen by chance. The environment doesn't cause a mutation. The environment is the antibiotic. It does not cause the mutation. So in general, you gotta just go back to mutations happen by chance and the copy of the DNA from the parent to the offspring. And sometimes it's beneficial, sometimes it's harmful, and sometimes it's like nothing, but in the future it might be beneficial or harmful. All right, the environment, natural selection. The environment selects for the traits that will be passed on because the environment selects, and what do you need for The environment is in picking, I'm gonna pick you to survive, I'm gonna pick you to survive, I'm gonna pick you to survive. That's not what the environment is doing. The environment, when we talk about the environment selects for, it just means that the environment is what it is. The variants in the population either survive well, or they don't. They pass on their genes to the next, next generation by reproducing because they survive well, or they don't. So again, the environment isn't picking who survives. The environment is what it is. We survive based on, are we good right now or are we not good right now? So our time to reproduce, mutations by chance, mutations by chance, by chance. Accidents and the copying of the DNA cause variability in a population. So as humans, when you're selecting a mate, when we're talking about sexual selection, shouldn't you really be selecting someone who has the most different genes than you have? So that you have two kind of gene pools that you can pass on to your offspring, more variation. But we don't often do that. Sometimes we do it, sometimes we don't. So like, again, if we acted biologically, we have a lot more variation in our population. Other modes of natural selection. There's other things that can cause evolution to occur, meaning that other means of saying you're better than you. You have an easier chance of surviving than you. So gene flow is one. Gene flow means that populations have access to one another. So let's say that out here that we've got our prairie and then we've got that road and then we have a wetland. And that road prevents mice from getting to one another, from the prairie and the wetland. They can't get to each other because they're like, oh, there's those cars. I don't want to cross the road, it's dangerous, I'll die. So they just kind of like stay to themselves. On the prairie, they're small and medium mice. In the wetland, there's medium and large mice. So what we see is differences in the gene pool, right? This gene pool is missing large, that gene pool is missing small. So let's say more in Valley, they make a petition to Payless Hills and they say, let's cut out that road and make it more nature area on this side of the campus. And when they do that and they block off the road and they just let nature do its thing and take over the road, then the mice are like, hey, uh, those car fins, the big killer things, they haven't been around for a while. So let's like explore. And when they explore, they are gene pools start to combine. They get to meet a different population. And so what happens is, is that now that the two populations have become one, they've added more diversity or variation into their gene pool. So just by the ability to meet a new population, you may add more variation to your population. So just like what I was talking about with, you know, going on a date and choosing who you date, is that you might be thinking either like they're cute, mm -hmm. ooh la la, but biologically, some of us have the ability to go like, they're really different than me, that's good. And that's kind of this idea of gene flow, is that if you can get two different populations to get together, you can have variation to the population. They also become a little bit more similar in that we have medium and we have medium, and they both have medium. Genetic drift is another, it's kind of like, genetic drift goes kind of the opposite. 
opposite way. Genetic drift or taking a population and making it smaller can have an influence on how much variance or how many variants or variations you have in a population. So um, I think this is like, it, it is more influential on smaller populations than it is often in bigger populations. Meaning that like, let's say that there's a new, new variation of COVID that comes out in January. And this variation um, in our 8 million people in the world, it kills off, eight, I'm sorry, 8 billion people, excuse me, that it kills off 6 billion people. That's a lot of people gone, right? But are we still left with 2 billion people? That's still a lot. So if we have a big population, and even though we're talking about something that might knock out like 70% of the population, sorry, I didn't do the math on that, um, we're a big population, so it's not that big of a deal. But what if they, there's just like us, and something knocks out 70% of us, then we might have like five people left, right? And like, what if a couple of those people can't reproduce, then you're left with three, and then what if out of the three, one of them's like, nah, I'm not mating with you. And then it's up to the two, and what if the two are both like females? And they're like, well, crap, we're dead, right? So big populations are less affected by genetic drift. Okay, so let's say in this population that we're looking at, we're just making a fictitious gene for fur color, fur color like hair color, it's usually more complex, but we're gonna simplify this down to just like, let's hypothesize this is complete dominance just for the sake of making it easier to understand. So in our population, what we have originally, generation one, we have three different allele combinations. We can have allele combination big B, big B. Go to the second row, you could have big B, little B. And our third combination, the last row is little B, little B. Anything with a big B codes for dark fur. Anything with two little Bs, gotta have two little Bs, the recessive trait, has to have two recessive alleles to express the recessive trait. Otherwise, a big B will mask the recessive allele. So in our population, we've got these three different allele combinations. Now, let's say that something comes along, a virus, whoop, knocks out everybody except for this little B, little B down here, and in the middle there, that big B, little B. We have eliminated, in this chance event, one allele combination. Big B, big B's gone. We only got a, blue, a big B, little B, and a little B, and a little B. When they mate, this is what the generation comes out to be from their offspring. So from those two, you can see no big B, big B's anymore. You've got big B, little B, and little B, little B. You also can see visually that now the recessive trait, where it was 25% in the first generation, now it's 50%. So that's a big shift. In one generation, that's a big shift. Okay, so now let's say there's another virus and these two survive. Now you've eliminated our other allele combination of big B, little B. So our population only has the ability to be little B, little B. So this is like genetic drift, where some chance disaster happens and only a few survive. If they're not the like most variant, it can be really bad news that eventually your population could all be exactly the same. And then what if there's a virus that, you know, it seemed like that having a little V was good, right? For this virus. Now what if a different virus comes along and it's like, nah, having a big V would have been better, dead. So that's what we call genetic drift. So a couple things can cause genetic drift. One is just like that major bad, awful thing happens. Could be a virus, could be a hurricane. Some catastrophe happens. Flood, fire. Could be humans, that humans are like, ooh, I like the ones with the dark fur best. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna shoot off all the ones with the dark fur. 
because it's going to look prettier on my white walls in my house. So it could be humans too. It could be overfishing where humans are like, ooh, let's get all of the really big tuna and not leave any that can reproduce the next generation because I want to make money right now today. And we don't leave anybody who can make more tuna. Regardless, and we'll talk about another kind of, um, oh, sorry, this is the population bottleneck, which is part of genetic drift. So in this case, something like my example before knocks out a lot of the different variation of population. So bottleneck means that we're going from a lot to something skinnier, right? The neck of a bottle is smaller. We're reducing the genetic variation. And we're, in this instance, we're doing it because of a catastrophe or human influence. So this shows you that our gene pool had four different colors and something happens where only nine survive. And of those nine, there's no green or, or, or pink or whatever this is. So we're left with blue and yellow only. So within a by chance thing that knocked out the majority of the population, we go from a diverse population to having half the amount of traits in the population. Northern elephant seals are an example. Elephant seals are so weird. They, have, they honk at each other for mating and communication. And they have this big like So anyway. In the 1800s, they were almost hunted to extinction. They were really good for, they have a lot of blubber, which is good for lighting um, oil lamps. They used, they melted down the blubber, use it for oil lamps, because back in the 1800s, they didn't have electricity yet. So they would kill them off for that, and eat some of them, and use their leather hides to keep them warm. And there were only about, like by the end of that century, there was only about 20 left. All 20 were very similar. But they were like in this group that hung out, like a big family. And so that big family had very similar genetics. The population's back up to like uh, you know, 30, 40, 50,000 now, but they're all really similar. So everybody's nervous, like what if like a virus or bacteria, um, a fungus comes and they're all susceptible, they'll be gone again. They'll be almost gone or gone again. All right, second kind of genetic drift is called the founder effect. This is where a group in the population, they're hanging out together and they're like, we're sick of this. Let's go somewhere else. Because of environmental resistance, they probably take off. The founder effect is a very negative thing when that group that leaves is very similar to one another. I mean, it could be that, like, the founder effect is like, well, I want, if I'm like, I want a group, I want to go somewhere else, because it's getting really crowded, it's getting all diseasy, and there's a lot of, like, dead things, and food's hard to come by, and there's a lot of predators, because we're so big in population. If I'm like, I'm gonna choose all the most variant individuals in the population and ask them to come with me. Well, that'd be great. But founder effect is like, you know, families might go like, let's all go. Come on, family, let's go. And their genetics is usually like closer. And so founder effect can have an influence on limiting that variation because a family group leaves. And they're very similar in their genetics. So usually their allele frequencies are less representative of the bigger population because they're like, hey, let's just like, family, let's go elsewhere. Let's try and survive elsewhere. So there's populations of Amish people because of their like, just ways of life that they like to do together. They kind of grouped up and they left the human population and isolated themselves. But they have some diseases that they carry, that if like, it's a genetic disease that is recessive, and I carry it, and my mate 
carries it, then likely my offspring are gonna get it. One thing that they do find is that they end up with an extra finger, which wouldn't that be good? That's like kind of a good thing, right? Like your hand, you have an extra finger, you could grab things better. Pretty cool. I always want a tail that can like hold my drink. They also have diseases that they pass on. So there's some like benefits, right? You get the extra finger, but then they end up with certain diseases that you don't see widespread in the general human population. Right? Piano player, guitar, they're like so much better. Better musicians, better tool people. Okay, let's stop there.